Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about the immigration woes of the United Kingdom, the UK. How will this controversy be resolved, if at all? Our guest for the show is our political, geopolitical analyst, Rupmati Khandakar. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Ajay. Thank you for having me. And you know, I love being on your show, always. So let me uh, let me ask you, you know, there's been so much news and action in the UK about uh, protests and counter protests. And uh, this morning um, in Bristol, there was an attack, an actual attack on an Israeli company. And so it seems to be getting worse. What is your sense of it? Uh, Jay, summarizing it in, you know, three words, one phrase is like the UK is burning. And uh, Jay, if we get down to why this, we'll start from where this riot started and what has come out of it and what is the nature of these riots? Is this, is this just a passing phase or is it something really serious brewing up in the UK? So uh, Jay, uh, just a briefing on what happened on uh, July 29th. So three girls, small girls aged six, seven and nine, they were uh, stabbed to death in the dance class in uh, Southport in um, England. So now what happens is the, the stabber is a 17 year old uh, person of Rwandan origin, British born parents of Rwandan origin. But a rumor spreads that uh, he's a Muslim immigrant named Ali Al Shakati. Okay. But actually his name was uh, uh, Ruda Kusani. Okay. So, um, Totally false uh, information which is going around, but pent up energy and pent up frustrations which come up. And you know, the anger that small children like always, you know, uh, terror targets are always the soft uh, targets who are helpless against or who are not armed. They are the ones which are targeted for venting out your political emotions. And that's where all the trouble starts. So when these girls were stabbed, there was a uh, uh, consequently and naturally, there's an anger which bursts out. And who does the anger go at? At the migrants. So there's a uh, on 30th July, people started throwing bricks on the mosques and uh, the the hotels, which have turned into a shelter for the asylum seekers. Now you know, Jay, England is a tourist uh, attracting uh, nation, and you have all these hotels, bread and breakfast, you know, quaint little places where we love to go and. When you see these things uh, being turned into a shelter for asylum seekers, there is frustration among the local pol uh, uh, population. And uh, they had only one, what was the uh, you know personification of the migrants? These shelters. So they started attacking uh, these shelters. And this unrest not only just started at Southport, it spread to several other cities uh, very rapidly. So we have a list of these cities to which these riots spread. And uh, this, though there was no organizing force, uh, there was, we always talk of how the social movement, social media plays a big part. And so there was this call for uh, organizing yourselves, call to protest from uh, right-wing influencers like Tommy Robinson and Andrew Tate and uh, right thought supporters who joined in. And Jay, the anger, coupled with the frustration was what gave these riots the violent streak. So uh, it's a, what do you say? Now it's a long-standing, frustrating, uh, pent up emotions which came out Jay, in these uh, riots. The UK is burning. Um, yes. The list, the graphic of all the cities involved, uh, including Bristol, which was this morning, most recently, uh, an attack on an Israeli building, an Israeli business, an Israeli um, research and development organization, which researches for various countries, including NATO, um, you know, it just demonstrates that this is all over the UK now. And, it, you know, and everyone has gotten involved. Uh, at first, it was the right wing, then it was the left wing, mm, mm -hmm. then maybe the right wing again, now the left wing, it's, you know, everybody is involved. And you really wonder who is provoking all of this. Does, is there that much, you know, pent up anger, Rupmati, that we have, you know, legitimate protests here? Or is somebody, mm, somebody provoking this? Jay, uh, I 
Personally, I feel it's genuine anger, it's genuine frustration, because as a tourist or as lovers of the British culture or uh, the nature or what it has to offer, as you know, third as a third view to this nation, you feel bad when you see uh, unfiltered migration coming in, unskilled migration coming in, and breaking the uh, crux of the culture which exists. Here. And uh, you can much imagine what it must be doing to the native people. In your neighborhood, if you have a couple of people come in, it's fine. If you have 10 people come in, it's fine. But when your entire neighborhood becomes overwhelmingly, um, uh, what do you say, uh, adverse to your liking, you start getting frustrated within. That is exactly what is happening in the UK. And Jay, we, we have discussed in one of our, pre our previous program that how Prime Minister Starmer is a, a, a left-wing uh, inclined Labour Party. So... Uh, they, you know how he is dealing with these riots. That is one aspect which has fueled these riots, rather than giving, you know, calming uh, effect to it. So these rioters are uh, threatened with serious legal consequences, and uh, you have uh, specialist officers who are brought in. They are given, and to the extent that they were uh, told that they would be treated as terrorists, these riots would be terrorism. So a person fighting for his own land, it was like going to the Scottish land and saying my land and all that. It's come to that point that the British are facing the British uh, police to fight for British rights. So it's kind of a very messy scenario. And uh, Jay, what gives a, a very uh, dangerous hue to this is that the counter protests, like you mentioned, the counter protests which are now being deemed as peaceful counter protests. They are being done in larger numbers. Uh, they are told to be peaceful so that the right wing, um, right supporters are overwhelmed by their numbers. What does this tell you, Jay? That right wing supporters in UK is a minority right now. You know what, Rupati, it's like um, this, is, this is heading toward chaos. Yes. You know, in, in the Bristol attack on the Israeli company, that was definitely left wing. Those yeah. were Palestinian supporters, um, Hamas supporters, which they have plenty of those in, in, in the UK. Um, yeah. And there was violence there. And the police called it uh, terrorism. But then there was a uh, media backlash saying you can't call it terrorism. They're just protesters. And uh, you're misusing the protest rather the media um, the, the in the media, uh, the rights groups criticize the police for relying on the terrorism characterization. So what you have is uh, the rule of law is being you know used or maybe misused on both sides of the equation. And mm -hmm. I, I tell you, I'm, re I'm reminded of what happened in January of 2017. There was a protest in um, New York City, right opposite the Plaza Hotel, one on the south side of 59th Street at the Plaza Hotel side, and the other on the north side, on the Central Park side. One was uh, for Trump, the other was against Trump. And uh, come to find that both sides, both protests, were in fact being provoked out of Moscow that yeah. the internet research agency, Putin's agency in Moscow, was calling people to join the protest on the south side and also calling people to join the protest on the north side. The idea was to create contention and controversy and chaos. And I can't, I can't help think that this may be happening in the UK. So much um, controversy, so many protests and counter protests that the country is burning you think there's any possibility of that i mean yes yes they're angry and somebody's playing on the anger but i wonder about social media but i want i wonder about people who would like to see chaos and who can we know can cause chaos using social media your thoughts yeah, Jay, so right about this, you are. Uh, hidden agendas, Jay, that is the key word in this. They have hidden agendas, and under the guise of these protests, even if they're genuine uh, fighting for their own rights, you have, you know, the Russian interests or the Hamas interests playing out because uh, 
there is chaos and they they find a uh, an order to this chaos and they uh, get their work done so always you know these elements and j one thing is for sure that they have found out the power of social media and spreading a narrative has become such a easy thing right now such a easy thing you 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 are using the social media for all your adverse uh, uh, agendas and uh, reaching out to every person who has a mobile or who has data on his hand uh, to spread the message so see the reach it's gone far and beyond there is no distance uh, and that is what is getting more dangerous che because you we know that a small protest can turn into a regime change can turn into um, large scale uh, life loss uh, large scale property loss and uh, bringing back to normalcy become such a huge task one one thing i i notice is that the attack in bristol did involve violence um there were people injured had to go to hospital and all that um and that's that's new that hasn't happened all that much in the in the uk protest but what i also found out was that the group that organized the protest in bristol had been organizing protests against the same israeli company for a long time and so that suggests to me and i like your thought about it that suggests to me that this is a kind of um, get on board uh, you know you you have a beef with this company you have a beef with the israelis you support palestinians and hamas and iran whatever and now you see the protests are happening um that there's a, a general decline in in law and order in the country and so you renew your old protests and make them worse you take cover uh in the new protests and you renew the old ones and so everybody's getting on board even people you know who have protested for a long time now they're joining forces and just trying to make a general mess what do you think yeah jay uh correct uh, very very correct because they are really not stopping and we know that anti semitic um, uh, th- uh, what is that the antics never stop never stop they will take every opportunity to uh, venture out into zones where they will hurt uh, the israeli interests or they will harm these companies and uh, harming economic affairs uh, economic uh, points of israel abroad is a very uh, uh, lucrative offer for them because they don't have the cover of israeli protection and their economic so more vulnerable so we have the houthi pirates in the sea and now these israeli company in uh, bristol so you can imagine this uh, migrant and british uh, conflict turns into uh, a, a targeted um, terror attack on a uh, israeli uh, business so that becomes uh, such a two pronged effect that they get jay and that is what uh, lures them into this and like you said somebody you know, something is financing them so i want to i want to explore something you mentioned in passing and that is the the whole immigration immigrant migrant issue in the uk it's not limited of course to the uk um you know uh, for the past uh, what 7 or 8 years it's been happening um all over europe including the uk and just because the uk is an island does not mean that people can't cross over without without documents uh and wind up living there and the uk had been fairly liberal sort of like germany a few years ago but that's that's changing because uh when the migrants get there when they do their immigration um they don't necessarily uh, integrate into the local community into the culture and uh, they stay by themselves uh, they form their own community and and they protest Uh, and they get in trouble and so i guess uh, the question i'm asking is in a larger context in the context of the the migrant phenomenon over the past several years uh, and then the immigration you know um um the immigration reaction huh, in europe and in the uk uh this is a natural outgrowth of it isn't it this is where people say we don't want them here they're not consistent with our culture they're undermining our values they're undermining our our lives and um arguably and this was not you know necessarily true they're killing our children um and so uh, this is got to be part of this whole process no 
you remember when um, there was a, like the Schengen uh, system of tourist visas came into existence. It was a well uh, processed uh, procedure where you sh submit your documents, you go to the airports, your question, you seek asylum, you go through the uh, documentation and you get your uh, asylum. But when Angela Merkel in uh, Germany started throwing uh, sympathetic do doors open to the Middle East conflict, um, what do you say, survivors or migrants? We can't say that. And people started walking in and uh, I've mentioned this before that the criteria was they asked their age to the refugees and 40, 50 year old men would say they are 14 years old and it was written 14 and they're allowed to go to school, Jay. So what kind of a system are you uh, putting through? And Jay, we know that any migrant who reaches the shores of Europe has a destination to go towards the UK. Now, the United Kingdom is... Um, uh, a conglomeration of four islands, but it's too overwhelming to have so many migrants coming in. The Maghreb uh, population coming through, you know, the, uh, what do you say, um, uh, the European population who wants to come to the UK. So it was just a hodgepodge and one-sided migration wave that came into the UK since the past decade, if we roughly say. And it's been, uh, it was a, a, a saying that the sun never set on the British Empire. And uh, it seems like the entire empire has come back to <laughs> Britain. So, uh, Jay, and like you said, the cultures don't mix that easily because when a migrant comes and you try to assimilate yourself or rather adjust yourself to the native culture while maintain your native culture but preserve the local indigenous culture, that gives a symphony, a harmony to your uh, migration but what happened what is happening is they are coming in and dominating and like you know uh, the British uh, are uh, a little bit of snobbish kind and when you see them intruding in spaces and the British way of life is disturbed so those frustrations have grown since decade decade and a half and when you see small children being targeted like this Jay so this anger came out. So I want to just bring into the point that if three children were stabbed and this much anger, what is wrong when Israel reacts to a terror attack? Everybody protests <laughs> on everything. Um, that yeah. We hardly think about the hostages, do we? Um, and yeah. I, you know, I, I, I think that people are, um, have blinders on. When they go out mm -hmm. on the street, you remember what happened right after October 7th. There were 100,000 people in London protesting and protesting yeah. in favor of Hamas. Exactly. Um, that was quite remarkable. And, and the, 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 the atrocities had just happened. Israel mm -hmm. had not yet attacked Gaza. They were waiting. They waited weeks. Um, but nevertheless, um, the, the uh, pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian forces were out there in the streets of London and New York. Um, okay. pulling down posters of the hostages and, uh, you know, getting... A friend of mine was there, and he's Jewish, and he was terrified, you know, how very anti-Semitic these crowds were. Uh, so all I can say is that, yeah, you talk about built-up frustration. Um, this, the whole Palestinian thing is really built-up frustration. Um, and 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 somebody unleashed it. Somebody organized it. You don't see a hundred thousand people get in the streets without an organizer, and that is so for every city in the UK where there have been pro-Palestinian protests. On the other hand, there have also been anti-Palestinian, anti-migrant, anti-immigrant protests. So I think we are in an inflection here in the UK and maybe in a number of other Western Western European countries. Uh, where things are changing, where um, the rule of law and the way it's enforced is changing. And I, I don't know whether it's going to a good place. Where is it going? This is a hard question. Where is it going, Rupmati? What are the changes that this all brings about? Yeah, Jay, it's really true what you say. See, October 8th, there were pro-Hamas uh, protests in London, in England, in New York. Just let tell me if... It was the native population. I think the UK people would have sat for a referendum. They would have thought, they would have gone into the pubs. They would have thought whether to support Israel, Hamas, like that. But why? Because the migrant population has become so dominant and so widespread that we have these visible protests of 
favoring Hamas rather than Israel. The British, uh, uh, the British wave of reasoning has gone, Jay. There are, there are uh, severe left-wing uh, inclinations now. There is nothing left uh, in the UK to have. You know, they're calling them the, min the violent minority right protesters. That means the British are in a minority in the UK right now. And that is extremely dangerous because Britain is undoubtedly overtaken by the migrants because the counter migrants have become peaceful it is like the conservative liberal uh, debate we have the neo conservatives and the neo liberals it switches the side so now the migrants have become peaceful and the natives have become violent so we are living in a society where <laughs> you are you are you are really you are, if, if if you have a right voice you have to keep it down <laughs> Otherwise, you're taken to court. What troubled <laughs> me in uh, in the Bristol case is that um, no sooner um, than the news hit hit the newspaper, there was an argument in the in the media about the legal implications of this and uh, what the rule of law meant and whether this the law on which they were arrested. And I think nine of them were arrested, uh, and the law on which they were treated as uh, terrorists so they could be held for 14 days without without charge was under attack. This is all within hours, within hours. Yeah. And so now we have a big argument. This sounds like the U.S., doesn't it? We have a big argument, pro and con, about what happened, about who was involved, about why they were there. And the media is just, you know, the media is very um, active in the U.K., you know, all those uh, newspapers that will print pretty much anything. Um, so, so now we have this big argument about who's right and who's wrong and what the law is and what the law isn't. And I, and I think you're right. You know, the old notion of being very process oriented, the rule of law in the UK, which is where it was invented. You know, the whole notion of precedent came from the UK. Uh, um, you know, that that's, that's at risk. And so my question still stands, Rupmati, where is this uh -huh. going? What what will it do? What will it do in the long term to the UK? Where, you know, there's going to be voting issues. It's democracy, right? Yeah. And you vote for members of the House of Commons and all that, and and they get up and say what they want, and they vote, and they may change policy. And a lot of a lot of migrants are trying to get into the House of Commons. Some are there That's already. And yeah. so, what what happens to the law? What happens to public policy? What happens to the country? Jay, we are having a big problem because the migrants are from a religion which has a political agenda. I keep on repeating this, that this is the only religion with a political agenda. They move in and then they try to gain political power. And uh, Jay, that is where the problem lies. Because, uh, for example, uh, Sadiq Khan is the mayor of London for a fourth consecutive term. 48% of the people of UK come out to vote. Who are these 48% of uh, uh, people? They are people who have moved into London, gained voting rights, and they want their own person to uh, be on the seat. Now, Sadi Khan, uh, uh, a couple of days back, said that people of Britain should learn Arabic to understand the migrants better. Why doesn't he tell the migrants to learn English so that they can adjust to British culture? So that is the twist, Jay, because they are not ready to accommodate, they are ready to dominate. And that is where this uh, pressure or this strain comes on the native population. They always think selfish, selfish. They never think of the other. Now, he wants the entire British population to learn Arabic, Jay. Can you believe it? <laughs> so if the mayor of London, you love Trafalgar Square. We love Big Ben, my mom's favorite place in the world. And, you know, we feel bad when you come and see that it's overtaken by migrants. It's not fair, Jay. It has to maintain its um, <laughs> UKness, if I can call it that way. So <laughs> overwhelming, Jay. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Now I'm going to ask you an um, even more difficult question. Okay. What can be done? to balance this? What can be done to return to some semblance of order? Jay, I'll give you a good example for this because in, in India, uh, Prime Minister Modi is uh, putting, it's in one of the manifestos that they want to put a uniform civil code 
Now, what is this? I'll let you, I'll give you one point of that Uniform Civil Code that if you have more than two children, you don't run for political office. How about that, Jay? <laughs> that is on the manifesto and that is in the house. So that will curb their political uh, ambitions. Jay. And what a tactic it is, I am telling you. Uh, it needs to be uh, carefully studied and researched so that it, that's the demographic, uh, what do you say, uh, handcuffing is the only way out from these migrants. Because for them, we have seen demography and equals to political dominance. You know, that's so interesting, Rupmati, because J.D. Vance is saying, um, he's one of his platform points, if you will, is that if, unless you have children, you can't vote. The cat oh. ladies cannot vote. So uh, we, <laughs> both sides of the pond are trying to, there are people trying yeah. to tink, tinker with the family. I, and I think, um, you know, uh, query whether uh, Parliament can do anything, uh, whether any of the officials can do anything about this right now. It seems to be in the, hand of the, the hands of the police and the you know, enforcement organizations. But uh, that's not, they're not doing that well. And it keeps happening. And the provocations, whatever is going on behind the curtain, is still happening. So my next question is, is this limited to the UK? Because, the, you know, the whole affair with um, the migrants coming north a few years ago um, and with the, the, the liberal reception they got, the you know, the, yeah. the humanitarian reception they got from uh, Angela Merkel, who was a leader in humanitarianism, and a lot of countries in the North followed her humanitarianism. And then after a while, maybe they were not so thrilled anymore. And then you had a reaction. Um, and then you had, you know, it's not just that the government reacts to protect the local people. It's that there's political reaction. So the right wing, say in Germany, all of a sudden gets stronger. And they're mm -hmm. against the migrants. They're against immigration. And that's, it's not just Germany. So, so what you have is this reaction goes not only social into the, call it the local uh, culture, but it goes into politics. And they elect people who are, you know, right wing uh, and do not want to see any more migrants or immigrants. In fact, they want to, you know, they want to uh, ask them to leave or throw them out. Yeah. I don't know if there's a, you know, there's a movement in the UK to do that. Certainly, uh, the Trump team and Vance, they want to, they want to, um, they want to deport a million people, I think, including That's people it. who have lived in the US for generations. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder if there's a, also a, a similar movement in the UK and other countries in Europe to deport migrants. What do you think? Yeah, Jay, uh, you remember Rishi, uh, Prime Minister before this, uh, former Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, uh, he wanted to send the migrants to uh, Rwanda. He wanted to create an asylum uh, uh, center for all the asylum seekers in Rwanda, sponsored by the UK. So that was the plan, but he was thrown out of power uh, because, and this um, government has come into place, the liberal government. So conservatives had a plan up their sleeve to do this. And Jay, it brings us back to uh, square one where Netanyahu says that the next stop is Europe. So uh, he knows what he was talking about. And it's not just the UK because now that violence spreads or say in uh, a few uh, years when life becomes miserable and goes back to middle age, dark ages in uh, UK, they will move to greener pastures, say Sweden, Denmark, uh, France, Netherlands, these are the places which attract them. Jay, you 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 love traveling to the uh, to Europe. You've seen how the scene has changed. Exactly, it's not as scenic as before. Everything has changed, and that is pure. The Roma people who have come into um, Europe is overwhelming. Jay, you see them on every uh, street and every corner, and uh, Jay, that doesn't work well with what we uh, admire Europe for. And this is purely from uh, a vantage point because we are not staying there. Imagine the frustrations if we were staying there. And uh, America is facing this because of the... Un Migration is good, but there has to be filtering. There has to be skilled, unskilled labor. 
which has to come in. There has to be, how can you accommodate these people? How can they go into different places now? Uh, when they were coming into the U.S. also, they were being uh, made to stay uh, in schools. The schools were closed. That is not right. When you uh, creep into the lives, personal lives of uh, people who are native to the place, it causes tensions. Like we go back to square one, it causes tensions. You don't like them. And they're being given a free pass to um, what is, settle in a country which they dreamt of coming into and starting from scratch without any skills, Jay, uh, it puts pressure on your own economy. Yeah, so, economy is the, is the magic word because ultimately this kind of disruption has an effect on the economy, whether you, sure. you filter the labor or you don't filter the labor. Um, the other thing is in a democratic country, it's much harder to manage this sort of thing, much harder to control it. I mean, you you can't um, you know take the position that uh, we are... We are going to manage you day to day. We are going to find out what you're doing. We're going to make sure that you're doing the right thing. If you're doing the wrong thing, we're going to deport you and all that. It's hard to do that in a democratic country uh, where people have do have rights. They have civil rights. Although I would say this, you know, that in, in an autocracy, take Viktor Orban in Hungary, okay? Um, migrants don't. they migrants don't have the same opportunities there. Yeah. He's going to squash them. And um, and and so what what it what it says uh, if you if you're in one of the democratic countries looking at one of the autocratic countries you're saying gee autocracy has a real benefit to protect our culture and that's what Orban is is saying so you know I, I think that over time there's a real possibility that not only will people be just you know dismayed over what's happening not only will there be right wing movements. But also things will move to autocracy. They will want autocracy. They will want, want to cut back on civil rights. And they will yeah. want you know, to take draconian steps like deportation. And uh, I think we're in an inflection point where that possibility exists. The last question I want to ask you is this. So it's happening in the UK. It's happening maybe not to the same visible extent in other European Western European countries, and so certainly France is a uh, something we should look at. <clears throat> but <clears throat> if you see, if you're in one of those other countries, and if you see what is happening in the UK, you say, on either side of the coin, you say, hmm, I want to protest too. I want to have the same phenomena that are going on in, in, uh, in the UK. I want to have it in my country because I feel strongly about this side of the equation or that side of the equation. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you do have the, the behind the curtain uh, internet research agencies from Moscow trying to, uh, you know, encourage violence and dissension and divisiveness. Um, and so don't you think this is going to spread as a copycat uh, phenomenon uh, all the way around Europe? For sure, Jay, for sure. In fact, within the uh, UK, there was a survey by YouGov and uh, they found 7% of the uh, population supports the violent protests. So uh, that was, 7% is a big amount. And, you know, the half of the people must be not willing to say it. And Jay, one more point that I would like to make that the migrants come in to these countries for the standard of living, for a better life. And what they do, on the other hand, is they overwhelm the social security systems. They overwhelm the health care. So when a native uh, um, citizen who has been here for generations wants social service or health care, he has to wait for longer time. He has to settle for substandard system because the system itself is treating so many other people than it was designed for. So that creates an imbalance Jay, of the facilities and amenities available to the native citizens. So it's just not just cultural imbalances that the citizens go through. Also, there are constraints on the facilities, the social care, the health care, and the uh, uh, price rise, economics, housing, rent. All these factors come into play uh, in a, what do you say? Uh, it's a domino effect that happens. So these migrants uh, create these kind of frustrations. It's not just cultural at all. And uh, Jay, all these, uh, when you have uh, uh, food 
off the shelves of Walmart because of uh, what is that Tesco in the UK because it's not available or shortage or something kind of it hurts the mm, local population and 100% is going to spread to other European countries because of their proximity. Jay. The entire European uh, continent, uh, the countries can be clubbed together as one big Russian uh, country. So they're small. And a time to spread these protests won't take long. Jay. And we know that though the numbers are small of the right-wing protesters, they are going to get violent because it's now going to be a matter of survival for them. Because just as in the UK, the sentiments hurt when the children were targeted. The same is going to happen in other countries that they are going to take it personally. They are going to feel that their personal space is not safe. It's violated. And uh, to take up arms or to protest against the system is going to be the way out because the system is protecting the peaceful migrants now. Well, Rubani, you know, before we go, there's one other mm -hmm. thing I think we should address. You know, you and I have been looking today uh, from the vantage of the UK and how it looks from the UK to Europe. Um, but what we really haven't talked about is is what the United States uh, should be thinking about this, what it can learn from this, uh, how it can draw parallels um, to this kind of protest and, uh, and you know, coming violence, if you will. Um, so what what should what should the American voter think about what's happening in the UK and Europe over this issue? For America, uh, the, uh, the what do you say, the advantage that America has is the space, the in uh, land area. It's huge. It's It can accommodate without overwhelming. So right now, it's at a normal point. UK is a small island, so it's overwhelmed. Uh, America has to uh, take care because Jay, this is reaching recession, and like you know, uh, America is the hegemon of the political system as well as the economic system. So a recession in America plays uh, has an, a comprehensive effect on all the markets, on all the uh, prices in the world. There is dollarization at a strong uh, hold everywhere. So this care has to be taken that the migrants are controlled in America, overwhelming. Uh, it's it's a promise that they're making in election um, uh, speeches, Jay, just because they know how much of a trigger it can be. And Jay, that is the danger point because all politicians are treating this as a trigger rather than addressing the crux of the situation. Like you said, the question that you put forth is how can we address it? They are not doing that. They are just playing on your fears. They are telling you, we will do this for you, we will do that for you. But when you come into power, it is impossible to remove these migrants and put them physically out. <laughs> when the Moscow uh, attack happened, terror attack happened, he marched them out uh, of the uh, airports. Every migrant was marched out. Why can these countries do that? Because of the political system. It's a dictatorship. They can do this. But in a democratic country, they will go to human rights councils. They will go to courts. They will bring out uh, uh, media. You saw uh, in the refugee centers how you have sympathetic uh, um, Senate members who will go there and, you know, show that um, America second, you know, Somalia first and all these things. So this, uh, this is different, Jay. As yes. a democracy, you have you have to have you know all, all the considerations on all sides of the compass, and and that means you have to be somewhat humanitarian. You have to you have to consider civil rights. You have to consider you know um, the, the 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 poor people who come try to find asylum. At the same time, you have to consider you know the people in the country who are offended by uh, those immigrants or the possibility. Um, that their lives will be affected by those immigrants. And that means Congress has to look at this. Congress hasn't looked at it in decades. Somebody has to figure it out. It's not, I agree with you, it's not just a political platform with promises that can't be kept. It's a matter of getting our government, including especially Congress, to do immigration reform and take account of all of these factors, all of these, these considerations.
Very important. And you and I should follow that going forward, Rupmati. Not only what's happening in Europe, but what's happening right here in the U.S. Thank you, Rupmati Kandakar, uh, our geopolitical strategist. We really appreciate your thoughts about all of these things. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Aloha, Jay. 